Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin cannon string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, I learned something tonight, and that's uh, that the Boston accent is a fairly mellow thing and doesn't really exist. Yeah, I think if you were to name the most distinctive accents across the United States, uh, certainly Boston's accent wouldn't place in the top 10 or 15 or even 20. Even 20 at least. Yeah, Brian Kelly was interviewed tonight. Uh, well, more he joined the broadcast uh, for, I believe that was a basketball game. Yeah, I think it was an LSU it, basketball game. We, we, yeah. we, where all the best Brian Kelly moments occur, apparently. <laughs> Well, all the great accent moments for him, yes. And he declared uh, openly that uh, that Boston didn't really have a discernible accent. It is like that stopped me in my tracks. I don't know. I I I feel like the opposite is true. But if Brian Kelly is saying it at a basketball game, I have to question it. Yeah, that is beautiful. <laughs> well. Welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys are all doing well. This is going to be a bit of a shorter episode. We're we're a day late thanks to some travel issues. So uh, we are going to uh, do a little bit of a review on the Packers game itself. But really, the Packers game itself is more of a setting to this story. It's not as important as everything else going on. It's more like the location for where everything converged into crap and the season ended. Basically, there's still the Chicago game, but still. right, yeah, so, the season is functionally over. Uh, that occurred as a result of a game that happened to be in Green Bay, um, and that's that's the truth of it, I guess. Yeah, so we're going to be going over that. Uh, an interesting article from the Defector, and we'll go into the mailbag as well. Just a couple of questions, just to round us out. Uh, but before we do, just want to thank everyone for listening to Norse Code. Uh, Happy New Year, and uh, thank you guys for listening. If you enjoy the show and would like to help us financially, uh, keep the show ad free, you can do so over at patreon.com slash Norse Code. Uh, for $3.50 a month, you can get bonus material, bonus episodes, uh, like the ones we've posted here, especially in December, just a ton of them. Uh, and we'll be doing another bonus episode here in about a week. So check that out over at patreon.com slash Norse Code. You can go, also go to paypal.me slash Norse Code as well and uh, donate there or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and get yourself a uh, Norse Code shirt, a Norse Code baby onesie, possibly even an Arif Arif uh, pair of Christmas socks, uh, just in time for next year's holiday season, right? Right. right. Let's, uh, let's, let's go with that. So check us out at uh, norsecode.threadless.com. That's obviously open all year long, but let's get into the game itself. And how the show was posted on the Norseman at like 1025 in the morning. Now that's not rare, but usually it's about that time. And the news about Kirk Cousins getting COVID came out maybe five minutes after that, which made your intro with justice for that interview more hilarious every time I listened to it. It was beautiful. And justice agrees, but he, he shared it specifically so that people would listen to the intro again. It, I mean, for those who missed it, I, I do suggest you listen to it just knowing, like, just knowing what, what happened know later. Now. The dramatic irony of figuring out what happens later. It, it, it's truly. I think I, I think I'd even tweeted out the opening to. I think I even like sent that over to Justice uh, in a tweet. It's like, yeah, this is like an all-time moment in Norse code history. <laughs> <laughs> About one vaccinated, one unvaccinated quarterback being morally superior to another unvaccinated quarterback. It just something to behold. So the the show was uh, relevant for a couple of hours uh, between one a.m. when I posted it and ten thirty when the news broke. Uh, I, I suppose the first thing we have to talk about is the fact that Kirk Cousins was unable to play the game, and that this was something that we had predicted on the show. For months, that something like this was going to happen at a pivotal at a, at a pivotal time, yeah, pivotal time for this for this team, a make or break moment. Yeah, we we, and we talked about how the writers of the season would structure it, and um, again, I, I want to mention predictable writing 
isn't bad writing. I think if you set something up, you have to pay it off and you do it in a way that's natural to the environment, that's natural to the way that you're writing the story, that's natural to the characters and true to what they do and the absolute, arcs that you're trying to create. Absolute, absolute Chekhov's gun here. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. You yeah. introduce the gun in the preseason. It has to be used. Yeah, 100%. So um, really, I think... Um, Remarkable stuff. I think that the writers did a pretty good job here. The only kind of other way to do it, obviously, is if, you know, Kirk Cousins had played, they had won, they'd found a way to go into the playoffs. And then in the playoffs, they go against the Packers a third time, and Kirk Cousins is unavailable for the same reason, right? That's the only kind of other way. But I think kind of this every other year playoff thing, I think that was getting a little bit tiring for the audience and for the writers. So I think that they wanted to kind of go out. Um, on this, uh, I, I, I want to say like a dramatic whimper, right? Because the Vikings aren't going out with a bang. There's another game left in the season, right? So there's a denouement period. But I think that they wanted to go out in a way that was both kind of true to the Vikings and and in character for all of the major players, um, but also, you know, didn't kind of repeat some of the tropes that I think fans had kind of gotten used to over the years. So I think um, some some pretty good writing choices here by the writers of the Vikings season um, but yeah, we knew that this was coming and it was really kind of satisfying from a writing perspective to see this coming. Of course, you know, fans of the team that want to see them succeed, you know, they're gonna have to wait another season or two or three for that to happen. But I think that, um, you know, which which meant that the game itself was was pretty unsatisfying. But I think from a writing perspective, you know, I think that was, that was really well done. It was, it was it was written well. The execution of it, boy, this was uh, this was a game. It happened. It was on national TV at night. And uh, you can't blame this one on Kirk Cousins is playing. That's for damn sure. Uh, boy, this. The team complained about feeling lifeless or you know, having like having like no energy in the building in, at U.S. Bank Stadium. I believe it was last week and mm-hmm. like, it, like against the Rams and how it kind of how they really, really felt it and how they needed to bring their own. And they really needed to like. You know, be able to do something. And I'll tell you what, after watching the third or fourth three and out, I uh I think they forgot it in Minnesota. If they if they were going to have it, I think they didn't pack it. Yeah, well they they said uh, you know, prior to the Rams game in the huddle that they're gonna have to bring their energy with them. I don't know that they they brought it in that game or or in the next game. I don't know that they have found their energy. It might be as lost um as that old NFL trophy from uh, was in 1969. So um, that that might be kind of the foundation for the next curse, right? Finding your lost energy. You know, the Vikings have never found it. Um, so far, we're two weeks into that curse. We'll see how that goes. Of course, um, your premier Vikings curse reporting podcast will be following that story along. Um, if the Vikings do find their energy, fine, no curse. But, you know, for now, it seems like they certainly didn't have any energy in that game. And I think that that extends to both the play calling and the uh, and in and, and the individual level of play from the players. And I think defensively, you actually did get a fair amount of defensive um, execution and enthusiasm and energy for the first couple of drives defensively. Like they were actually doing a fairly decent job, um, all things told. And then, of course, it kind of just snowballed from there. Um, they couldn't kind of keep up that level of defensive performance. So. Um, primarily an offensive issue at first. And then, you know, from then it kind of just spread to the rest of the team. Um, much like other things that spread. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, it, it was, it was a stultifying game to watch. It was so difficult to kind of keep watching. It's my job to watch it. And I was having trouble. Sean Mannion came in at quarterback. There was a lot of discussion. <laughs> this was over, widely panned. This was why this was widely panned as a terrible decision. <laughs> um, except by Chris Collinsworth, who at one point was asking to to unleash Sean Mannion. Yeah, set and him free. <laughs> I don't know of a much worse idea that could have I mean, other than what they did, I don't know of a much worse decision than they could have done. But uh no. Uh, unleashing Sean Mannion was a terrible idea. I don't think that there were a lot of good choices, but uh, Sean Mannion starting, I, I, I get, I get the reasoning why. Kind of, the idea that the team still had the possibility of making the playoffs, 
in in like a in an absolute miracle style like finish. Right. But like they had the ability to do it. They were still technically competitive. Therefore, you bring out the second string, whatever. But it also appears from the presser and the clarification afterwards that uh, Zimmer doesn't appear to think that uh, Kellen Mond is anywhere near ready to be playing. Yeah, the three snaps we saw also uh, kind of went into that. So to kind of to step back a little bit and kind of just talk about the Sean Mannion, Kellen Mond stuff. So uh, Kellen Mond hadn't been active um, I guess until last week, I thought he was, this was his first week active against Green Bay, but I guess he was active the week prior. Um, the website that I used to kind of check that, which I did check before I tweeted that out, um, is usually really good about uh, making sure they, the players are credited for games that they're active in, even if they don't play a snap. Um, but I guess uh, I guess in this instance, they missed it. Um, so, so Mond uh, had been inactive for almost the entire season before then. Um, and so this is kind of an important piece of context for how how this goes. So Sean Mannion had only practiced with the team once this week, right? Because he was on the COVID reserve list, a common theme for Vikings quarterbacks, uh, and and couldn't practice until Friday. So he hadn't had much first team reps. So presumably, and I, I think this was the case, Kellen Mond was taking first team reps for um, the first couple of days of practice. There's not that many days of practice in an NFL week. So um you would think then, you know, Mond has a little bit more experience with the first team, but the totality of practice, which the Vikings didn't have Sean Mannion during camp, right? It was Kellen Mond versus Jake Browning, um, which, by the way, Kellen Mond lost that battle too. So let's, you know, um, the uh, Sean Mannion has had significantly more overall practice with the second team and a little bit with the first team. There's not that much first team practice for backups in the NFL anyway, but a little bit of practice with the first team, significantly more with the second team, and just more practice executing the game plan in practices, executing that the offense that they run. Now, Kellen Mond is primarily on the scout team. He does not take that many reps with the second team, much less the first team, if at all. I would be surprised if before last week he took any reps with the first team. Um that means he is significantly rustier than Sean Mannion, despite Mannion having missed some practices as a result of, of being out and also not having those two practices um, that, that Mond had in, in the lead up to the week. And so the amount of experience in that offense that Sean Mannion has is many, many, many times greater than Kellen Mond. So that's one thing I wanted to make clear. The second thing I think is that Kellen Mond and every opportunity I've had to watch him in a Vikings uniform has been catastrophically bad at quarterback like i don't mean like i've seen sean Mannion in in a vikings uniform several times both on the field on sundays but also in the preseason and in training camp and even in some practices although you very rarely get to see um actual practice occur during the the portion open in the media and practices um and he has been just bad right and for your backup to be just bad that's kind of normal i think sean Mannion is on the bottom half of backup. So I'm not saying that he's a good backup or anything like that, but um, he's only been bad. Right. And I don't think it meets the backup test for me, which is if uh, your starting quarterback goes down halfway through the game and you're winning by a score or two, your backup is going to allow you to finish the game with a W right more times than not. That's the backup test. They don't need to go out and win a lost game for you. They just need to win a one game for you. Right. And I don't know that Sean Mannion meets that test. Right. So I don't think that he's a great backup. But, but what I've seen is bad versus catastrophically bad. Like, I, I don't want to undersell this point that that Kellen Mond has been really bad in the practices that I've been able to see. Right. The fact that Zimmer after the game also seemed to indicate I've seen enough of Kellen Mond. Right. Like, that's wild. Right. Like, that, that was pretty upfront and abrasive. Right. Um, so I'll say that. Right. The second thing is um, there is I want to acknowledge this, that there is still, despite that, a somewhat reasonable argument. I think, well, actually, I shouldn't even say somewhat reasonable, a reasonable argument to play Kellen Mond in this game instead of Sean Mannion, which is if the Sean Mannion is so bad that you cannot develop a winning game plan around him, then it, it, it makes more sense to introduce uncertainty into the equation because you could lose by more. Right. It is possible that if you put a worse player in, you lose by more. That's not shocking. But if you've got a wider range of outcomes, if they're more likely to make big plays um, at the cost of some pick sixes or whatever, um, 
then you've got more opportunities to potentially win the game. So I get it, right? I talk about this all the time, that underdogs should pursue volatile game plans. They should engage in deep shots a lot more often, for example. They should, um, if they can, instruct their uh, defenders to go for picks more often, right? Um, If you're a significant underdog, right? And so I think that even though it is more likely that you lose 42 to zero, it is also more likely that you'll win. Um, It's just, you know, the percentage chance of you winning uh, is is low in either circumstance. So go for the edge cases where you might win in a weird game, kind of like, yeah, hey, Joe Webb was bad against Green Bay, but did you see him against Philadelphia? There's a lot of uncertainty and volatility that you can introduce that might mean that if a couple of things go the right way, Antoine Winfield forces a fumble, Jared Allen forces, an, I think, another fumble in that game, right, that you can kind of capitalize and do some stuff with, um, hey, maybe the Packers will drop a pick or something like that, and that'll bounce into you know your, your, your player's hands for a touchdown. But in order for that to happen, you have to throw deep, right? So the volatility has to bounce your way, but you have to introduce it, right? And Sean Mannion theoretically can't. So I, I get the argument. In fact, I sympathize with it most of the time. I think that underdogs should pursue highly volatile strategies. I think Kellen Mond has been, and I don't think the Vikings think this way, by the way. I think most NFL teams don't think this way. So I'm not saying that they had this in mind and dismissed it. So I'm not going to give them the full benefit of the doubt. But I think Kellen Mond had been so bad in practices that this was not really part of the conversation, right? That that he might be able to do some stuff and get you out of there. Because after the Vikings started losing by three scores, the only reason they ever put Kellen Mond in for three plays was because Sean Mannion's hand was cramping, which makes a lot of sense. It's a very dry environment. It's very cold. Um, so, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, so so that is kind of part of it. And then the three plays that we saw, I think are really good evidence of it because I think a lot of people see, you know, Kellen Mond, who's a much better athlete than any other quarterback on the roster, right, for sure. Um and has a stronger arm probably than anyone else in the roster. They think that he's a he's the type of quarterback to produce big plays, but historically he's not. You know, Texas A&M didn't have that many big plays. He's a very conservative quarterback from the perspective of producing big plays. Now he'll challenge tight windows, so from that perspective he can be aggressive, but um he really doesn't throw it deep. He he didn't really throw it deep at Texas A&M in any of his years. Um his final year at Texas A&M, he actually did have a pretty good third down conversion rate, but his first two years, um, they were they were really bad in terms of third down conversions. And he would throw it intermediate a lot. He'd throw it short a, a fair amount as well. Um, and so it, you're not getting a guy who is predisposed to big plays anyway. So I don't know that that was on the table, but the three throws that he had, you know, two completions, fine, but they were short, which is not any different than, than what we saw from a lot of the Sean Mannion throws. Um, the other one was a pick six, and I cannot emphasize this enough. The fact that it was dropped should not change your evaluation of what happened there. There's a reason that the PFF grade for Sean Mannion is like 72. It's like a little bit below average, right? And Kellen Mond is like 29, right? It's like it's like Garrett Bradbury's worst days. Like that's what his grade was. And it's because he threw a pick six. It is not any credit to Kellen Mond that the linebacker dropped it, Right. You can't have these kinds of catastrophic timing issues if you're a starting quarterback in the NFL or if you're going to be playing quarterback for an NFL team, right? And so what little we saw confirms all of these other priors that we have, right? That Kellen Mond isn't taking reps with the first or second team in practices, that he couldn't beat out Jake Browning in camp. That he couldn't, that he was so bad that the Vikings signed Sean Mannion. I'm not going to say sight unseen, but without any understanding of his level of play after he got cut by the Seahawks, um, it was so bad that they uh, that that they they couldn't help but but think about Nate Stanley in a competition with Kellen Mond. Like that's how bad he had been playing, right? And as to his athleticism, I. And I wrote this in my scouting report. I actually, a couple of weeks later, I was talking to somebody who was, he would just asked me for an update on Kellen Mond. Um, and, you know, I was like, you know, I, I, I'm not very confident, but, you know, he's a rookie, right? And, and in that context, it, it doesn't really matter um, for, for this conversation because he's about to play a game as a rookie. But, you know, I, was, I wasn't too negative because I thought, you know, he's a rookie, you know, things might happen uh, down the road. But I thought that he had been playing very poorly and he wasn't really doing a lot. And then he asked me specifically about Kellen Mond's mobility and athleticism. And I'm like, well, yeah, he's like, fast but you don't really see it a lot right like he doesn't when he scrambles it's not he's not getting away from people and and the guy said i've been following kellen mond since high school 
right? Like I've I've just been moving around beats a little bit, but I've been fo- I just happened to been able to follow him since high school through Texas A and M and whatever. And Kellen Mond's issue is that he is essentially a sprinter. Um, and so, which doesn't really translate, especially to quarterback in the NFL, it's not the kind of all around athleticism that you see with Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, where they're really quick and agile in addition to their raw speed and power, right? Um, it, it, you know, they've got the ability to kind of change directions and be dynamic and kind of feel what's happening in the pocket. And Mond really just has straight line speed, which can be useful for like a wide receiver, but is very, very difficult to harness as a quarterback if you don't have all these other athletic traits. So I don't know that we would have seen those traits in this Vikings game because that actually kind of matches what I had seen in college and in the preseason. So it really does kind of match the idea that he might not be able to create these kinds of big plays outside of maybe, you know, designed runs, which maybe the Vikings should have put in um, for for the couple of plays that Kellen Mond was in there. Um, But, you know, if you don't have an offensive line that's used to blocking that, you're not going to get that. The second thing I want to say, so that was the first thing. That was a pretty big bit. Sorry. The second thing I want to say is that I don't think Mannion played as poorly as everyone says he did. He played poorly. There's no question about that. I think that he played a little bit better. Like I watched it back again and there are a lot of times where Mannion has a deep shot available to him that he doesn't take. That's true. There are a lot of times when the play call is so conservative that he can't help but throw short of the sticks. That's true too. There are some times where I thought he maybe made the wrong read but he didn't put the ball in harm's way, right? So that's one. Um, but two, um, his best plays were all taken away from him until the fourth quarter, the 30-yarder to KJ Osborne, right? His best plays were all taken away from him. Um, the 24-yarder to Tyler Conklin that turned into a 12-yarder um, because the the Packers challenging and reversing the ruling. The other 24-yarder to Tyler Conklin that was taken away because the Christian Derrissaw penalty, the I, I think kind of nails throw to CJ Ham on fourth down. Um, that was a defensive hit and or a um, drop, depending on how you chart it. Pro Football Focus does not chart that as a drop. Um, they actually do chart two drops for uh, Sean Mannion, neither of which are relevant here because there was the tap pass to Justin Jefferson that's counted as a drop and like. You know, that has no that plays no part in my evaluation of Mannion. Like that doesn't count as a completion or an incompletion. That's just a running play that gets counted as a pass. Uh and another drop uh to Alexander Madison in the two minute drill in the fourth quarter, which I don't care about. I didn't I didn't watch that back again. So that's not part of the evaluation either. Um but he had plays taken away from him in the form of um, you know, defensive penalty or offensive penalties or uncalled defensive penalties. Again, another throw to Tyler Conklin, which you might wonder why he's throwing to Tyler Conklin so often. Justin Jefferson was getting doubled, right? There are instances where he should have trusted Jefferson and thrown it to him, and that's just a product of not really being comfortable with who Jefferson is because he doesn't have that much practice with him. Um, But there were a lot of instances where Jefferson was getting doubled, and at least one instance I saw where he was getting tripled. I think not intentionally, just by the nature of the offense versus the defense that was called. Um, but another throw to Tyler Conklin where it was a clear hold by a defensive player, uh, a Packer, and Tyler Conklin falls to the ground. Even if it's not a hold, Tyler Conklin has, has fallen to the ground and it was an accurate throw that would have gotten a first down, right? And again, these are not that many plays I'm talking about. He didn't have that many good plays, but the ones he did have were taken away. And so now we're left with a highlight reel of just these really either boring plays that get you like four yards or these bad plays, Right. And I just, and I want to say like his bad plays were not catastrophic. His good plays were taken away. He was simply a below average quarterback. In fact, uh, watching him, I thought that he played very poorly watching him again with the all 22. I thought he played better than I would have expected going into the game. I don't think very highly of Sean Mannion, even though I just made this whole argument that Mannion should be playing ahead of Mond. I think the, the ceiling for Mond in that game may be a little bit high, but the floor was so catastrophically low. The median outcome was so low. I just don't think that that availability was there for Mond. Like someone made this point that like, Hey, you can't really use that play against Mond. He only had three plays in the game. Who knows what would have happened overall. And it's like, just think about your priors for a second. First, everything we know about Mond going into the game is, is pretty pessimistic. But beyond that, what are the odds that a good quarterback in that game throws a pick six in their first three passes, right? Like the odds are not zero. Good quarterbacks throw pick sixes. Someone you pointed out like a couple of pick sixes that Kirk Cousins threw, which great. 
But if you take a three-game sample of Kirk, how often do you find yourself with him having thrown a, a three-play sample, uh, with him having thrown a pick six, right? It's not that often. So what's the likelihood, right, that a good quarterback does that versus a bad quarterback? And the likelihood, I think, is fairly low, right? It's 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 a small sample um, that's true, but the fact that these are the only samples that we get is by itself a little bit telling, and also the fact that um, our first exposure to him is this is also telling. It's kind of like um, when, when of course, I'm going to reference Jeremy Lin because I was like insane about him. But when Jeremy Lin broke onto the scene, his first like seven starts were nutso, right? Now, he did end up having a flaw in his game. He couldn't drive to the left or something like that, very Trubisky-ish. But um, there was a problem in terms of kind of evaluating what likelihood it was that he was playing at a really high level because he was a really great player, or he's playing at a high level because of variance and he was merely a good player, or if he was just an average or below average player and he was just playing at a really high level because of randomness, right? And um, the problem is there's a difference between your first exposure of a guy and a random streak in the middle of a season, right? And so you can't really compare the two. Here, your first exposure of a guy uh, is that he... He completes two passes, neither of which convert, which, you know, Sean Mannion didn't convert a lot of first downs either. But then the third pass, which would have ended the Vikings game way sooner, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I I don't think that the Vikings made the wrong decision here. The second argument people are making is like, hey, this is either an indictment of the front office because they didn't evaluate correctly, or this is an indictment of the coaching staff because they didn't develop correctly. And I get it, but like people's brains are broken on the concept of a rookie quarterback. If you're not drafted in the first round as a rookie quarterback, you're probably going to be really bad. Um, the example that people get, like I know that like Russell Wilson and Dak Prescott have like distorted people's understanding of third and fourth round pick quarterbacks, but like that's not just the comparison sample. People this year are talking about Davis Mills, right? Davis Mills has been playing pretty well at the back half of the game, uh, back half of the season. Um, but the first game Davis Mills played in was awful. He threw two picks. I think one of them was dropped. One of them wasn't. And he had a 44% completion rate. He was truly bad, truly bad. And he was the backup quarterback. He actually got to take reps. Um, Mond didn't. Uh, And we would be comparing Mond to the first game of Davis Mills, not to the Davis Mills that got to take a bunch of first round, uh, a bunch of first team reps, and then got to play a season and get get some, uh, you know, experience in, Right. The question wasn't, should the Vikings have found ways to play Mond throughout the season, which I don't think they should have, but that's that's not the question either way. It's, should they have played Mond for this game, given all of what we know? And the answer is absolutely not. And that the development curve for third-round quarterbacks is not that great. Third-round quarterbacks are bad. Sean Mannion was a third-round quarterback. Like, what are we talking about? Most third-round quarterbacks do not bear out as even backup quality guys. Like, a lot of the backups that you see are either randomly dispersed throughout the draft or former first round picks like that's that's kind of where you're at right there's a lot of undrafted backups because there's a lot more undrafted players that end up on nfl teams and so you look at backups you're going to see a lot more undrafted guys than you thought because third round picks are not so much qualitatively better and because there's so many more undrafted guys to be able to get that shot in the first place it's a numbers game in two different ways but if you're a good quarterback or a good prospect, there's a really good likelihood that you're just going to get drafted in the first two rounds. So I, the expectation for a third round rookie is wild to me. First third rounders are not generally that good, but second as a rookie, I don't think that that's an indictment of either the coaching staff or the scouting staff that Mond wasn't that good in uh, his first year with the Vikings. That's very normal. Um, now if he continues to not be good and there's all kinds of indictments you can make about the coaching staff and the, and the scouting staff enough that they're probably gone. Right. Um, you know, then that would be an indictment of, of those two groups, but I don't think like, Oh, your third round rookie quarterback isn't ready to play in a game. Wow. You must really suck at this. Yeah. That might be true. If it's a third round guard, which we can talk about, but (laughs) (laughs) Uh, sadly, yeah, right. But it's not really true of a, especially a guard that was like supposed to be ready to play. And like, you know, Chess Rat's a third round linebacker that's not ready to play because he was a quarterback in college. Fine. But like a quarterback, way different. Quarterbacks get drafted so high. So that's the rant there. So this was not an offensive game plan that worked for anyone whether it be the Vikings or the viewers at home, it seemed to work fairly well for the Packers. Yeah, I guess but- the Packers were fine with their game plan. 
yeah, that, uh, so I want to pick apart something that is, it's the Zimmer saying it's the second time we've heard it in two games and it seemed as out of place this game as it did in the, uh, in the Rams game, his complaint at the half was that the Vikings weren't running the ball enough down 20 at least. Yeah, I don't really, uh, so one thing that that kind of helps here is that your first half score differential generally does not change your run pass ratio unless you're 30 behind and 20 behind. I kind of get not moving too far away from your desired run pass ratio, but there's two things here. One, the running game isn't working. They're averaging 2.5 yards a carry, right? Um, I think actually less by that point in the game. Um, but two, maybe it, it should. Maybe you should be throwing the ball more down 20 even before the end of the half, right? Because, like, I get that it is not as meaningful as it might seem. Like, teams can kind of get the game closer uh, in a hurry in the third quarter. Not that the Vikings are a very good third quarter team. Um, but, like, the signs are there that things are going to go sideways for you faster than they are not, right? Um, you're not going to always hold the Packers to field goals, right? Which we found out after the first two drives. Um, so yeah, that didn't, that didn't make a ton of sense. Plus if you take a look at it, I think play by play, there's not a lot of individual plays where it makes sense to run the ball, right? Because if you're at, at third and 20, actually they did run the ball in third and 20, that weird example. Um, they sure did. Um, but if you're at third and 13, right? Primarily on third and 13 teams are actually attempting to convert, right? You're not running the ball. Right on second and twenty, the Vikings will run. Most teams won't. Right? Uh, maybe on one of the first, like on the sack, right? That they took the five yard sack. Maybe that should have been a running. But there's not many plays that you can point to. Where you say they should run the ball. I they should have pretended to run the ball way more. There were, uh, I think, six play action dropbacks in the game. One of which, of course, was taken away by penalties, so it doesn't count in the PFF stats. Um, so, there, but there were six play action dropbacks in the game. And there were three bootleg rollouts in the game. Um, now, of the six play action dropbacks, one of them occurred late in the fourth quarter, so I'm not going to count it. So let's say there were five. Um, three play action bootleg rollouts. Those were Sean Mannion's best plays of the game. And maybe you could say one of the other play actions was a bootleg, but it got um, short-circuited by the fact that it was a sack. I The footwork, I think, is not a bootleg footwork, so probably not, but that's, you know... You could maybe make the argument. Um, they were his best plays. They just happened to be taken away. The first one was the first down to Tyler Conklin for 12 yards. That that could have been 24 had it not been for the backers challenge. The second one was the Tyler Conklin one that went for 24 yards that got taken away because of penalty. And the third one was the one on fourth and three to CJ Ham that hit Ham in the hands that just happened to get batted away by a Packers defender that I thought was actually a pretty good throw. Um, plus, you had other open players on all three of those plays that Mannion could have thrown to. And arguably, I don't think Sean Mannion should make that throw, but on the fourth and three one, there was a throw that I think most quarterbacks should make. It's just Sean Mannion's arm strength is pitiful. But like Kirk Cousins, there's a there's a throw that you'd want to make back across your body to Justin Jefferson. He was kind of open on a crosser, right? And that's a good throw. Um, although the backside post, well, it's not a post, but the backside dig of a bootleg, you don't throw, you don't see a ton. Um, that's one that I would want Kirk Cousins to make. That's not one that I'd want Sean Mannion to make. Um, but yet other players open and then they just go away from the bootleg. And if they're going away from the bootleg because play action isn't working, I get it, but they continue to do a couple of play action passes, right? If they're going to go away from play action because there's no credible threat of the run, then they should also stop running the ball and they don't stop running the ball. So I don't think they should have run the ball more. That's nuts to me. I, I know, I think Luke Braun just published a piece saying that they should have run the ball more. Uh, sorry, Luke, the piece does not actually do that much in terms of providing the argument that they should have. And I think you're wrong, but um, just another drive-by shooting of Luke Braun. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they should have pretended to run the ball more because those play action bootlegs were working. They were working. Do it. It was frustrating to watch. I think frustrating is the best word that's not profanity that one can use to describe the offensive side and really the defensive side of the ball too. Because on the defensive side, well, actually, you know what? 
I'm going to hold off on defense for just a moment because we have to do a Zubruder-esque breakdown of the finest catch of the game. And you know exactly the one I'm talking about. The one where the, it was, it, I believe it was the longest play of the game too for the Vikings. Is it the Osborne one? No, we were not oh, talking about Osborne. Oh, oh, it was, it was the longest play of the game through the first three quarters. Yes. yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. That. Sean Mannion was getting Tyler Conklin killed on that one, by the way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, to, there used to, dry. to be, there, there used to be a thing back when it was much more legal to just kill a man in the middle of the field. Yeah, hospital balls. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like it, you, you'd, you'd never, you'd rarely see that in the first two quarters unless your quarterback was terrible, uh, because that was just the sort of thing that they did. But you used to be able to throw the ball in the middle of the field, and the defender would just murder him, and it's like, oh my god, really? Mm-hmm. And Conklin. For the record, totally legal hit, but like in that cold, yeah. Even if he like had the ball in his head, like, even if that hadn't have popped up into the air, that thing was going on there. Like, there's no way, no. You could play the run that play a hundred times out of a hundred. There's no way he keeps the ball in his hands. Yeah, my God. But Garrett Bradbury, um, the savior. Three, of the team. <laughs> three NFL catches in his career. I thought it was two. It turns out two regular season catches, one postseason catch. Uh, boy, <laughs> we should you see the think fear about in the eyes of those corners. Right, the fear in there because he had already broken out to them. They were going to have to make the move. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Like, yeah, he was already how, there. How, yeah, it's like how do you take him down? Do you go low? Do you go a high? I don't want this to turn into a, like a, a come on man piggyback ride. Like how do you take him down? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is something that the Vikings should seriously investigate. I already tweeted at Madden to um, fix Garrett Bradbury's uh, catch and spec catch ratings. His catch rating, I believe is 56, which is also his Jersey number and his spec catch rating, I believe is the lowest that they'll have in Madden, which is 40. Um, that's obviously not true. So, um, yeah. So that that's that. I, I think that if Garrett Bradbury continues to play poorly, which actually I don't really recall how he played in the game because I was paying a little bit more attention to the pass blocking of CJ Ham and Tyler Conklin, both of whom were doing a very poor job as pass protectors. I'm sorry to say that, James. Um, Hey, CJ Ham tweeted out a dad joke today. I would walk into fire for that. I, you, you would. And um, I, I don't know. Maybe you should, right? Like, maybe you're right. Like, he rules, right? But I'm just saying, as a pass protector, he was not astounding. So. Well, there. if you're going to call out, you you better start calling out people who were astounding then. Because I'm, I'm expecting crickets. Uh, well... You you are going to love the answer to who was the highest graded offensive lineman in pass protection. Oh, my God. Who? Ole Udo. Boy, if that's not an indictment of this game <laughs> and this offensive line, I don't know what is. Yeah, so it looks like Gare Bradbury had uh, the second worst pass blocking grade of anybody. The worst, of course, being CJ Ham. Um so the worst of any offensive lineman, which means that he has now had two good games and three bad games since coming back. Um, no, I guess it's too good and too bad. I don't know. Um, oh, for pro football focus, it's three bad, too good. For me, it's too good, three bad, uh, in that order. Um, cause I thought against Detroit, he was fine. And I thought against Pittsburgh, he was great. And against Chicago, he was whatever, but PFF gave him a higher grade in that game. Anyway. Um, so it looks like Garrett Bradbury's resurgence is fake and that he is not actually good anymore, despite, um, having come back from, uh, uh, a benching with a bunch of introspection, uh, in which case uh, probably should be considered um, a tight end. Maybe just make him a tight end. He in high school, I guess that he played um, tight end. Uh, I, I, the one thing that's interesting to me is uh, I think that I think that the person I'm trying to look at the eligibility rules because I, I want to. I want to be confident, but I think that 
you can have a an eligible center. And please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not going to do any more research than I just did for five seconds. Um, but you can. So all that matters is that you have five players on the field that are not eligible. That's all that matters for the rules, which is why you get stuff like the swing gate formation. That's why you get that weird Colt special teams play. Um, they can be anywhere except they have to be on the line of scrimmage, right? And they have to be wearing an ineligible number, right? And so you can bring Blake Brandle out there, declare 56 eligible, and then snap the ball. And I, I, I wonder if there's a rule about who snaps the ball, but I think not. Uh, snap the ball. Uh, there is actually the the oh. center cannot. A quick Google of this uh, declares that the center cannot declare as an eligible receiver while also being the player who snaps the ball and being unable to line up in a permissible way. Oh, thank you, Cron dot com. Um, well, no, hold on. Uh, sporting charts. Nope. That okay. That website is dead. Um. So is this for because the rules are different for NFL, CFL, high school, and college? That's the thing. Yeah, and just going over and literally uh, NFL dot com, it says no. Oh, okay. Well, then just line them up at tight end. I don't care. Well, I mean, realistically, you could have the ball snapped from someone else. It's Kirk Cousins right. is used to that sort of thing. That's true, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, and, and also, I mean, Garrett Bradbury can line up at guard. Um, which is not what you were saying, but <laughs> um, he, yeah, uh, anybody else can snap it. Let's see. So have Garrett Brad because he's clearly a better receiver than he is an offensive lineman. Um, so that that was awesome, and we sh- should see more of it because he's very clearly capable of this. And he apparently caught a ton of passes in high school, so it's there. It's all there. Well, let's talk about the defense. And let's go to the mailbag. All right. What a terrible performance. And and for the first half for a cut you know, if you're able to to put a if you're able to make Aaron Rodgers get if you're able to like get him frustrated, if you're able to put in this, put yourself in a situation where your defense is atrocious but you're getting stops, this is not something that is sustainable. <laughs> this is like oh you need your offense to be able to do something afterwards. If you if you get them to to stop at three points, great. Your your offense has to be out there to get a touchdown. That's how it works against Rodgers, unless you're the Saints, in which case all bets are off from that Week One game. Right. But if you are in a position where you get where you get Rodgers to stop and they have to kick, fantastic. Your offense has to show up. That's absolutely the opposite of what happened for the offense. And this team did the whole bend not break, bend not break enough times where eventually it just broke. It over. actually broke. Yeah. I don't even know where to start. Um, so, Mackenzie Alexander <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, was signed up to play at corner this game. <laughs> no, he was a safety, wasn't he? No, Mackenzie Alexander played corner. He did play corner. Well, on paper, he played corner. Arif, what happened? Uh, he got burned toast. Uh, the Vikings decided not to have Patrick Peterson follow Devonta Adams until the beginning of the third quarter. Uh, and so when Patrick Peterson did line up against uh, Devonta Adams, he actually had a pretty good performance, all things considered, considering that Adams is one of the top three receivers in the league, maybe number one, right? But uh, that didn't happen. So Mackenzie Alexander got the opportunity to test himself against the NFL's best, which is what you want as an elite football player. Um, and he got tested and he f- failed his test a lot. Many times. It, it was bad. In fact, you know, in the first quarter I was watching, a, I was watching a replay and my only thought was why is Patrick Peterson on the other side of the field on this? Why is he, nowhere near Devonte adams like i know vikings fans have, have trolled packers fans for 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 the last couple of years about how Devonte adams is not the best receiver in the league blah 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 that doesn't mean you put mcgen that doesn't mean you put mackenzie alexander on him like you don't believe your own press right yeah exactly yeah that's <sighs> well, I mean, because the Vikings, I'm not going to justify it, but I'm going to say that the reasoning is that the Vikings, you know, have figured 
you know, actually our pass defense is pretty good, which uh, shockingly is kind of true despite the results of the, all these Vikings games that we've seen so far. Um, the pass defense has been fine, and they've mostly played sides, right? Patrick Peterson plays on the right side, uh, defensively, left side, I think offensively. Um, whoever is available that week plays on the other side, and Mackenzie Alexander plays in the slot, and that has largely been working out for them. Obviously, Alexander's been having a rough year. Um, but I, I feel like when you're faced with the situation, and it's not like, you know, Marquez Valdez-Scantling is bad. I mean, he nearly ended the Viking season a couple weeks prior, right? But, uh, you know, when you've got as much of a talent differential between that and, um, and, and the rest of the receivers in the roster, I think that you experiment with that, especially because Peterson is no stranger to that. Like he did that a ton in Arizona. He knows how to do it. He does. He can switch his footwork up really quickly, which is kind of the primary reason that you do this. And, uh, you know, Mackenzie Alexander has to switch sides all the time in the slot and whoever is the other guy, um, is, is normally a backup. Like that was the problem, right? Because you had Chris Boyd in there. I guess Ty Smith, uh, was in there a little bit. Um, or, you know, Hey, on another week, it might be camera dancer. Whoever that guy is also has a lot of practice playing on the other side of the formation on the, on the, on the left side or the right side or whatever. Right. And so, um, everybody at that point has practice with an extensive amount of practice with their footwork on either side. And so I think that the, the normal reasoning here is not as strong generally. And then on top of that, you have to add in, by the way, that's Devonte Adams like figure it out, like fit, like do something. Right. Uh, and so th- without that, you end up with like, you know, Chris Boyd ends up giving up 57 yards to Devonte Adams. Uh, Mackenzie Alexander gives up 46 yards to Devonte Adams, including a touchdown. Um, Alan Lazard also worked them a little bit, but I, I just, I would rather have Alan Lazard bullying Mackenzie Alexander who I don't think actually got any catches against Alexander specifically, but um, I would rather have Alan Lazard doing that kind of stuff because he's going to average like 10 yards a catch, right? It's not going to be as much versus Devonte Adams who could go off for like the entire length of the field or Marquez Valdez Scanlon go the entire length of the field, right? Like that's the issue. And so there was some pretty poor game planning defensively, but you know, again, there were moments that the defense had and the offense did not have a moment, right? Like that's, we're talking about a bad defense versus an awful offense, right? Um, I thought Anthony Barr played lights out, which was kind of wild. Might have been the only one who played lights out, but he but he played lights out. Um, Xavier Woods had opportunities. He did not always make good on them. I think he got mossed by Lazard at one point. That was not great. Um, but at least he was kind of in the area code. Uh, Kendricks, I don't think, had a particularly great game i don't know if it was awful or anything i don't think he had a particularly great game um had a pretty bad missed tackle if i remember correctly uh harrison smith was fine um didn't actually see him get tested in coverage all that often so uh great but um yeah the cornerback group just got toasted just toasted. i was gonna i was gonna ask if anyone actually played particularly well i know eric kendricks did not yeah i thought anthony Barr played really well um Dalvin Tomlinson, it would have been nice to see a lot more out of. Let me check his PFF grade real quick, see what they have to say about him. But I thought Tomlinson had one or two moments, but the rest of the game for him was like pretty bad. Um, good Lord, Ty Smith is the highest defensive grade. That's an indictment. <laughs> um, brother. Also, what does that say about Harrison Hand that Ty Smith keeps on? Like, Ty Smith, who is that? Uh, I guess uh, I, uh, they're not as impressed with Anthony Barr as I was, but... Um, yeah, Dalvin Thompson also got a really bad grade from PFF. So uh, on that on that note, we're on the same page. Um, the third worst defender, uh, the second worst starter behind Blake Lynch, which, you know, Blake Lynch. Um, yeah, uh, the, the problem, of course, is that when the Packers go up, they, like any other team, are willing to run the ball. They also have a really powerful power runner in uh, A.J. Dillon, who is currently... And here's the worst of his crimes. He's currently proving justice correct on being a potentially better running back than Aaron Jones. And uh, I would not love for justice's takes to be correct. So I would like him to stop that. But for that to happen in the Vikings game, the Vikings defense needs to step up and they missed so many tackles. Or if they didn't miss tackles, which 
looks like the percentage of tackles they missed was indeed high, according to PFF. They got dragged along for the ride on the tackles that they were making, still allowing three or four yards. Like, you know, if you're just getting out strength, that's like one thing. Like AJ Dillon has these like thighs from God, right? Like that's going to happen if you're like Xavier Woods. But like if you're Eric Hendricks, you know, I, I know that like Eric Hendricks is not Coming out of college, he was not a run first guy. He was a coverage first guy, and he kind of added to his game over time, and he became a better run defender. But he never ended up having, you know, as much strength as some of these, like, like Dante Hightower or Anthony Barr, right? And Anthony Barr is is, is not that strong for his size, but he's like two hundred fifty pounds, so he's going to have a little bit more stopping power. Um, I like Eric Kendricks should be able to stop AJ Dillon one on one because that's his job. That's what he's getting paid for, right? Dalvin Tomlinson should be able to stop AJ Dillon one on one. He weighs an A.J. Dillon plus an Aaron Jones, right? Like, he should just have that stopping power. Same with Armand Watts, who is not as big as Dalvin Tomlinson. I think he is outweighed by Tomlinson by, like, about 30 pounds, right? But he should be able to stop. And even in instances where the defensive linemen were able to get off their blocks, which primarily they weren't, um, like, I think Sheldon Richardson did a fine job getting off his blocks. That's about it. Um, And he's playing end, so he's not seeing Dillon as much, right? But... um, even when they do get off their blocks, they're not, they're just not in an opportunity. They're not making their tackles. They're getting dragged along for the ride. Um, I know Dalvin Tomlinson missed. It's, it seemed like at least to me, two tackles. I know that Armand Watts missed what it looked like to me, two tackles. PFF marks them as one each. Um, if you're, if you're 30 pounds heavier than the guy, then you don't really have an excuse. Like if you're Xavier Woods, I get it. You got trucked. Like you should be a safety and you should be able to, but like, I get it. Right. But if you're like Eric Kendricks and you're getting paid 10 million a year, if you're, um, you know, if you're a defensive tackle, you should just stop the guy. And they, they weren't able to stop the guy. So that, that like Aaron Rodgers will be Aaron Rodgers and he'll have a great game once a year against the Vikings. I don't know why it's only once a year, but great. Once a year against the Vikings, he'll have a great game. Um, and this was that game. And if you're going to do any, if you're going to be able to bounce a comeback, you need to be able to stop the run. And uh, the Packers have a backup offensive line in there, uh, which, you know, in the interview, Justice outlined why they're all actually quite good, except for Royce Newman, who as a run blocker is quite good. Um, but, you know, they've got a backup offensive line in there. You should be able to stop the run. And they weren't able to do that. And so though the biggest reason the Vikings weren't able to come back is was, was because of their offense, Obviously, the defense played a big role because you don't get a four-score lead um, without dominating your opposing defense. So, um, yeah, the defense was bad. I thought the run defense was considering the expectations entering the game, even though the run defense is generally worse for the Vikings. It might be the worst of the NFL at this point by expected points. um, The run defense should should have been held to a higher standard than the level of play that they exerted, more than the pass defense, because... You know, Devonte Adams, Aaron Rodgers, you're just going to lose some of those, right? Like maybe you should be better against Alan Lazard than you were. Fine, but like the the passing game, those players made some plays. The running game, God, it felt like every run from Green Bay was successful. I'm done talking about this game. If you are, I cool. feel like this this is there's there's nothing else to glean from it. This was the setting for offensive and defensive play calling that was questionable at best was reaching and was an absolute just it it was it was uncomfortable to watch it it it, i had the same feeling of watching this game on a sunday night that i would have if i were sitting in a movie theater with my parents and a love scene happened on the movie <laughs> screen. That level of cringe, that level of, oh my, like head in hands, just can I not experience this right now? I would rather do anything but. You know when I turned off the game? I'll admit, I turned off the game. I turned it off when Kellen Mond went out. When Kellen Mond got brought in, I went, okay, well, this is interesting. When Kellen Mond got taken out, And Sean Mannion came back in. I went, you know what? I love myself too much to put myself through the next couple minutes. I sat through twice the Eagles, uh, the Eagles championship game loss. I'm good. (laughs) I don't need to watch. 
I don't need to watch anything else. Nothing else is going to be relevant that happens in the next couple of minutes unless like the stadium falls apart like it did in Washington and it crushes Kellen Mond. Like that's the only way this game was going to be like interesting in the final seconds. And it didn't. Apparently they have strong enough uh, zip ties at Lambeau to keep something like that from happening. <laughs> Let's talk about how this affects things moving forward. And in essence, we can also talk about the article from the defector that is that uh, that came out here a couple days ago about well, not even a couple days ago. I think it came out yesterday, uh, which would have been Monday, which talks about nepotism in NFL coaching. Yeah, and, there's a I'll let you keep going. Yeah, and and just as a as a final point uh, on this, the rats are leaving the ship. Yeah, so the article obviously talks about the NFL at large, but it primarily focuses on the Vikings, right? Um, the article talks about, well, it has, a, it looked like three sources to me. They have a source A and a source B and then another source um, within the team, um, which is interesting because a lot of people that are responding to Kaylin Kaler are tweeting at this article, um, you know, she's the one who wrote it. Uh, are saying, oh, an anonymous source. And it's like, well, it's three sources. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, so, but uh, yeah, because it's like source A, source B, and then like a player, I think. Um, plus uh, another player or two who kind of push back against the nerve. It primarily looks at Clint Kubiak, Adam Zimmer. It briefly mentions AC Patterson. Um, and then it also talks about kind of the NFL's at-large problem with nepotism. Um this, I think, is important primarily because of what James said, because there's a canary in the coal mine. They're, they're throwing each other under the bus. Um, they're pointing fingers. They're distancing themselves um, and protecting themselves. And that only happens in a scenario where everyone feels like they're about to lose their jobs. Um, the last time it felt like it was possible that Mike Zimmer lost his job, this wasn't happening, right? This was back in 2019, right before the Saints playoff game. Um that wasn't happening. This is much more significant. Now, we're all very confident that Mike Zimmer is going to lose his job at the end of the season, but it kind of adds on to that pile. Um, now, there's like there's people who have responded like, you know, Adam Zimmer's qualified. You know, he's got a ring. You know, he worked, I think, for eight years um, without Zimmer, right? It's not as if Adam Zimmer is like Clint Kubiak in the same way because I believe Clint Kubiak outside of one year, I think with the Jets, maybe I'll, I'll take it. I'll double check that. Um uh, has been uh, with with uh, with Gary Kubiak. Adam Zimmer has spent time um, without Zimmer, right? So since 2013, he's been with Zimmer, but uh, he was with the Saints from 2006 to 2009. He was with the Chiefs from 2010 to 2012, all without Zimmer. Um, and uh, of course, in 2009, he won a Super Bowl as the assistant linebackers coach. Now, I don't think that that actually means anything. If you're an assistant linebackers coach, I don't think that that gives you as much credibility if you win a Super Bowl or not, right? Um, but, okay, so Gary Kubiak actually, or Clint Kubiak has been uh, outside of Gary Kubiak, but like very briefly, like 2015, he was the Kansas wide receivers coach and he was the Texas A&M quality control assistant in 2010, 2011. Um, yeah, I, I don't think, so I think as soon as Clint Kubiak was qualified enough to be a position coach in the NFL, he ended up becoming one for Gary Kubiak. So it's, it's pretty close. Whereas, whereas uh, Adam Zimmer had some other opportunities. Either way, he gets his foot in the door because his last name is Zimmer and because his last name is Kubiak. Um, the tough thing here is that... Uh, so some teams apparently have... I didn't know this. Some teams have uh, nepotism uh, rules in place that either prevent you entirely from uh, from hiring someone in your family or um, require some restrictions in place. Uh, the only kind of uh, rules regarding nepotism that I'm very familiar with are like federal rules where like if you nominate someone in your family to an important position, uh, they need to be like super qualified for that nomination to go through. It's not really the same in the NFL where your qualifications are, are less you know, pieces of paper that you have and more kind of the network that you've been able to build. Um, but uh, some of the requirements in the NFL for, I think, one of these teams that was listed in the article is that if you're uh, 
uh, in the same family as somebody else on the team, they can't report to you. They need to report to somebody else. And I believe um, it was either Miami or, or some other team in the in Florida where that was the case. Um, maybe Tampa Bay, um, but uh, in in Arizona, not allowed at all. So that's that's interesting. If you're in a position to hire somebody or in a position to be um, kind of considered above them on uh, the organizational chart, um, you you they they can't employ someone that works with you. So. Um, that's not true for most NFL teams. The tough thing here, of course, is that these, these are like the, these people are people who have more exposure to football than anyone else. And so they become more qualified. How did Clint Kubiak become an offensive quality control assistant for Texas A&M? Well, at the time, Gary Kubiak was in Houston running the Houston Texans. Um, he could have just called the people which, uh, you know, College Station is like an hour away from Houston. Um, he could have called the people at Texas A&M, which I believe was Kevin Sumlin. Uh, I don't remember quite sure at the time. And said, hey, can you can you give my son uh, a, a meaningless job to, I shouldn't say meaningless, but as an entry-level job, as a graduate assistant and, um, uh, you know, an offensive quality control coach. And, you know, Kubiak was, played safety for, for Colorado State, right? Like Clint Kubiak played football he was a team captain. He even got invited to play in an East-West Shrine game. And so um, he's got football uh, qualifications under his name. And so it totally makes sense that he'd become a quality control assistant or a graduate assistant, right? And so that's what he did with Texas A&M. Um, when uh, he uh, started, uh, he applied for a job. I, I imagine his connection to Gary Kubiak helped. Got the job as an offensive quality control assistant, enrolled at Texas A&M, became a graduate assistant. Um, along with a, uh, a along with a job as a slot receivers coach, and then um, was able to use that to say he's got enough of a resume to be qualified to be a quality control coach, uh, this case with the Minnesota Vikings in 2013, right? And so he built a resume that makes sense. It follows from where he went, right? And so from there, uh, he was able to kind of leverage uh, his resume instead of his connections to get jobs. But then, of course, his connections also helped him get a job. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten a job otherwise, right? So that's the problem, is that Adam Zimmer got in the door because of Mike Zimmer. Plus, he spent a lot of time with Mike Zimmer in Dallas, not in an official role, but like as a son, right? And he got exposed to a lot of football. So he has a, a leg up from a qualification standpoint. And so it is difficult to argue that some of these guys don't have the resume qualifications, but of course, if you keep hiring family, the NFL is going to continue to look like you. Uh, in which, in this case, it means that there are equity concerns about, um, you know, groups that are not often represented at the NFL coaching level, whether that's you know people of color or women or whatever, right? And so that kind of magnifies an already existing problem through entirely natural forces that are easy to explain and not necessarily all that nefarious. Now, the problem for the Vikings, of course, is that um, it, it seemed, well, from the article and from a lot of people's impressions, it does not seem like Adam Zimmer is doing a lot. Uh, certainly, the idea that uh, the time Andre Patterson finally got elevated to a defensive coordinator role um, despite being extraordinarily good at his job, Adam Zimmer got elevated at the same time as a co-defensive coordinator. Um, that's a slap in the face, uh, according to the article, and I, that follows to me, honestly. Um, so, oh, looks like uh, looks like Adam Zimmer... Uh, yeah, it makes sense that Adam Zimmer got a job with New Orleans because um, Sean Payton and Mike Zimmer were on the same staff in Dallas. That makes sense, yeah. Um, so he was doing a favor to, but it wouldn't be nepotism, right? It would be doing a favor for a friend as opposed to family, uh, at least nepotism in the strictest sense of the word. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's these connections that, that kind of follow, that give you the resume that allow you to defend yourself when you promote this guy, right? When Rex Ryan hires Rob, Rob has a background as a defensive coordinator, right? you know, coincidentally also the New Orleans Saints, but like there is a qualification there, right? Um, the issue is whether or not you can fairly, can, can Mike Zimmer fairly evaluate Adam Zimmer? Can Gary Kubiak fairly evaluate Clint Kubiak? Was Mike Zimmer doing a favor for Gary Kubiak, elevating Clint Kubiak, not just to offensive or quarterbacks coach, but to offensive coordinator? Um, yeah, maybe. And in which case, if you're doing favors at really important positions, then you're going to get less qualified people, but you know, one of the greatest defensive minds of modern football 
is Wade Phillips. He's the son of Bum Phillips. He got a job because of his relationship to his dad. You know, one of the most important offensive minds right now is Kyle Shanahan, right? Like, son of Mike Shanahan. Like, it's 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 not that complicated to see how um, some of the uh, – Scott Turner is turning his, like, career around. He's actually – um, been credited for some like good stuff on the offensive side, you know, the son of North Turner, right? Like some of the best coaches, uh, Sean McVay is the son of John McVay, right? Like, um, no, I guess he's the son of Tim McVay. I think his uncle is John McVay. Um, the, some of the best coaches are related to, uh, people who have been in the NFL. Like it's, it's, it's tough to overcome that. It's, it's both a problem of opportunity and a problem of direct hiring. It's not just the problem of direct hiring because they are hiring people who are qualified. It is the, it is the qualifications process. It's the pipeline that matters more. And I wish the article kind of focused on that more. But this article then goes into saying that a lot of defensive problems and a lot of offensive problems are related to the fact that these people were kind of shuttled through a pipeline and at some point you don't check their actual qualifications. You only check their paper qualifications, right? You don't see if they're good at their job. You see if you can defend the existence of their job to a panel if need be, right? Um, and that's the problem. Um, yeah, it, there's there's a former player in here. There's a current player. There's uh, two people, quote unquote, close to the team. Um, there's a number of sources in here that are fairly critical of... Uh, of Adam Zimmer. Um, I I shouldn't say, well, some of Adam Zimmer, but mostly of Adam Zimmer's hiring and position on the team. I I don't know. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's a big story within the context of the Vikings specifically. Um, There are alternate perspectives to consider, but um, it is, uh, it is very relevant to kind of the current Vikings hiring cycle. And again, this sort of thing wouldn't be coming out if news on Zimmer was going to be good. This is very much... like we, We've used the word indictment a couple of times already this show. This is where this is going. There, If you had any, any hope or any belief, and from Zimmer's resigned size, I think he sees the writing on the wall just as, uh, just as everybody else does. This is coming. And there's not... The only question is... If Spielman's going with him. Yeah. And it sounds like more and more that that is more of a question. I was very confident even a couple of weeks ago that Spielman would be going with him. Uh, there's just more and more kind of noise and movement towards the idea that Spielman's not. Um, mind you, that doesn't necessarily mean that Spielman will remain the general manager. It could be like a John Elway situation where they just kind of promote him, give him fewer responsibilities and give him more money and just kind of like a thank you for your service. We're really good friends now sort of thing. Um, And so he might not be the GM anymore, but more and more there seems to be noise uh, unattributed, you know, treat these more as rumors than as reporting um, that, that Spielman might find a way to stay with the Vikings organization could be as a general manager might not be, but that Mike Zimmer is almost certainly headed out. Yeah. It's uh, it's something. Well, let's go to the mailbag. It's a shorter mailbag, but uh, but it is still uh, it still has a number of important questions, such as uh, the first one from Raul, who asks: uh, First off, has Zimmer watched Ted Lasso? Everyone knows that when you're a heavy underdog, you must roll out trick plays, also known as elaborate set pieces. <laughs> Does this point to a lack of creativity on offense? I mean, the idea of of Zimmer watching Ted Lasso that seems that's like amazing, far fetched. No way. I think. Uh, you know, even just using your example here as for for you know rolling out trick plays, he I'm I'm more I'm much more confident he's seen the Water Boy than right, Ted Lasso. Right, exactly. Yeah, like look at the Mud Bowl for instance, the very the game at the end of the game. Like, yeah, that's uh, you, you you do something. You, you you roll out trick plays or you do something interesting, something different when you're down that far. I think the Vikings menu of trick plays is primarily either on special teams, like a a punt protector running it, um, which, hey, maybe do that. Well, you only do that if you see a look you like. But I mean, it's the the Packers special teams have not been, you know, killing it. Right. Um, No, I believe atrocious. Uh, I believe justice is actually referred to them as a war crime. Yeah. 
Um, it's ironic for justice, a known war criminal to say that. Um, we, we discussed this in previous episodes. Justice is a war criminal. Um, I, 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 we, we just feel a bit, I would say a, a bit worse about it now that he has COVID, but like, right. A bit. Do you really feel worse about it? Right. Like I look, if justice goes down due to COVID, I'll be sad, but let it, lest it not be forgotten. He is a war criminal. Um, so that aside, uh, probably do some of that. But I think a lot of the trick plays are probably near the red zone, which, you know, the Vikings were not tourists very often. Like They did not visit the red zone all that much against Green Bay, if at all, question mark. Um, well, they did They end up scoring, but like, uh, you know, early in the game. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's where most of the Vikings trick plays are from. They did, they ran a tap pass, which is sort of like a trick play. It's not quite one. But, you know, if you're going to play action, you might as well flea flicker, right? <laughs> like, just just, just do something. See if you can catch him unawares. Like, you've got Justin Jefferson, and I understand that he was getting doubled and tripled. I talked about it. But on a flea flicker, he's, he's, it's probably one-on-one. And, you know, I know the ball will take three years to get there, but I'll trust Justin Jefferson's ball skills against, like, Eric Stokes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Number two, it seems like Zimmer gives every reason for why the team is not running the ball to his liking, except for the obvious one, the team is not running the ball well. It's striking to me that this team fails at something it emphasizes. Is this a talent, coaching, or scheme issue? If this is a talent issue, is the Bradbury pick the single biggest miss of the Zimmer era? Um, Yeah, if we exclude stuff like Jeff Gladney, right? Um, the single biggest miss. Well, it's not Anthony Barr that he signed a second contract. It's not Teddy because his knee blew up. Um, it has to be first. I think it's a quant Treadwell, honestly. Like I think who is now on a six game, 50 receiving yard streak, but you know, he was legitimately bad. Um, I, I think Garrett Bradbury has played better than Laquan Treadwell. And I don't think it's fair to compare them one to one. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to say, Garrett Bradbury plays a bunch of games. Laquan Treadwell didn't, you know, for the Vikings because receiver is a much more fungible position than, uh, than center. And so if you're starting a guy at center, you're probably going to start him for a while. Um, it's going to take a bit to kind of move that up and move on from that. Um, it's much more likely that a, that a receiver that's not learning is going to take a little bit of time. Whereas a center, you want to get them kind of maybe in as early as possible. So it's not fair to compare them one to one, but I do think that Bradbury in a Vikings uniform has played better than Laquan Treadwell. Bradbury is not great, right? But he's played a lot better, I think, than Laquan Treadwell. Um, I I don't know that in I don't know that the Vikings talent in this game up front was all that bad from uh, the perspective of running the ball, right? Because you've got Christian Darius, you got Brian O'Neill, um, Oli Udo can run block occasionally. It turns out he did well in this game at that. Um, and Ezra Cleveland has had more good games than bad this year. Um, and so you got Garrett Bradbury, who is a much better run blocker than he is a, a pass protector. So there's talent in terms of the capability to block and run the ball. Um, plus, Dalvin Cook has been good when he's not been hurt, and I don't think he's hurt. So um, I, it's not a talent issue. Uh, I think they just weren't as prepared, which sounds like a coaching issue, right? Because I don't think it's a scheme issue. They've been able to run the ball well, um, and they've been able to run the ball well against the Packers. So I think it's a coaching issue. I think that they didn't prepare them for this game. Um, Bradbury is probably number two in terms of biggest misses if we're talking about first-round picks um, of the Zimmer era, unless you want to talk about Sam Bradford, but at least he played well for a year. Um, there is that. Yeah. But yeah, well, let's I, I go think to, it's Bradbury. Or, let's go to Joey, who... Yeah, let's go to Joey, who has a somewhat similar question. He asks, is there an analysis of how effective teams are at drafting? I'm not sure if Rick Spielman is good at this or not, or is it uh, just luck? Uh, Primarily, the evidence suggests that it's luck. Um, If you take a look, for example, at some of the most uh, well-rounded classes, the 2019 class for the Titans, the 2017 class for the Saints, the 2015 class for the Vikings, and then you take a look at another class that they had, um, you know, you'll, you'll find kind of the opposite results. Um, generally speaking, long-term studies of this suggest that NFL teams are not particularly better or worse at drafting. Now teams can be bad at drafting and can stay bad at drafting for a while. Um, but it is hard to be better than league average. It's only 
it's only easy to be worse. And I think the Seahawks are a really good example of a team that was on a consistent like six or seven year run of being bad at drafting. Like they drafted this not so good 2011 class, I want to say. And then 2012 obviously was fantastic. Um, and then after that, it was just like a rough going. Um, so you can be bad at drafting, but it is really hard to be good at drafting. Um, I think the best scenario right now might be the Colts. I think they've got more return on their draft picks um, uh, currently on the roster than, than others. I, I don't know for sure. Um, and we'll kind of see if that, that plays out going into the future. That might be worth kind of taking a look at. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that um, we, we generally see it. Now, if you take a look at, you know, GM rankings, like I know, um, I, I think it's NBC sports edge, but they used to be called Roto world. Um, they do GM rankings every year and Spielman tends to be kind of around average in terms of what they consider in, in their, um, ranking system. I say system, it's kind of more of a feel thing from them. You can kind of tell from the articles, but, um, Spielman is primarily good at trading, uh, versus other teams, uh, in terms of selecting talent. Um, it seems like he is about average, maybe a little bit below average, but you know, um, you can say, Hey, Garrett Bradbury was an awful pick and you'd be right. Ole Uda was a fantastic pick. Like, you know, yeah, he might not be good, right? But you don't get the level of talent that you get from him in the sixth round very often at all, right? Um, obviously, I've mentioned the 2015 class a few times, not just in this episode, but in previous episodes. Um, but, you know, th- th- he's had a number of, like, fairly good picks over the years. Like, I-, I think maybe they didn't get return on Mackenzie Alexander in the second round. But, um, you know, they're already getting a lot out of James Lynch, right? Um, generally speaking, he's been about average compared to the rest of the NFL. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know that it, it, it's fair to do that. It's really the bigger issue is not in terms of talent identification. It's in terms of how to invest your resources, what contracts you sign, um, and, uh, what decisions you make about team building, which is very similar to that first thing about how to invest your resources. But like, you know, do you invest your resources more in the draft or in free agency versus kind of what positions do you prioritize and stuff like that? Um, that I think is, is an issue. Um, it, it I, I think it is interesting to me that the two times that the Vikings went out of their way to intentionally draft an interior offensive lineman, because I still don't think that Ezra Cleveland, was meant to be an interior offensive lineman when they drafted him. I think they just, they were left without any interior offensive lineman on their board and they drafted the next best offensive uh, lineman that they had, which is a tackle. Um, The two times they actually went out of their way to draft interior offensive linemen, um, Pat Elfline and Garrett Bradbury, they've been catastrophic. Whereas before they had been primarily drafting interior offensive linemen in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh rounds and had been doing a good job until they stopped suddenly doing a good job. Right. They, they had a really great run with like Sullivan and Fusco and, and a couple of others. Uh, and then they just could not get um, a good offensive lineman in the fourth, fifth, sixth or seventh round. Like they got Travis Bond, David Yankee, and it just it wasn't happening. Right. Um, and so they finally decided to invest in the third and first round. And both of those were busts. So um, I guess we'll see about Wyatt Davis, but early returns are not good. <laughs> Uh, next question is from Ryan Menson, who asks, if the Vikings fire both Zimmer and Spielman, do they risk missing out on a top-tier coaching candidate because they would need to hire a GM first, or or they wouldn't be able to uh, start interviewing coaches until after the GM is hired? Uh, so it kind of depends on ownership, right? Because um, ownership sometimes lets the general manager pick the coach, and sometimes they don't. My understanding is that the Wilfs will consult their general manager, but will end up picking the coach, right? And so if they don't like who the general manager likes, they won't hire that guy, right? They might try to get somebody that that everybody likes, but they'll end up hiring who they want to hire, my understanding of the Vikings. Um, but you, you might hire a general manager who's got a list of coaches that you like and approve of, and then the general manager will go after one of those coaches, right? Or the, or the ownership will go after one of those coaches, right? Um, so it's, it's different for every team, and I don't think that um, there's a huge risk of the Vikings missing out on a coach that they definitely want because they need to hire a general manager first or something like that. Um, they can certainly start interviewing as soon as possible. The only thing is, if you hire a coach first and then a general manager, 
you either need to have a situation where the coach is essentially picking the general manager, which doesn't often work out, but sometimes does. Like I think, you know, as much as I just bagged on the Seattle drafts, like I think the John Schneider, Pete Carroll situation is one where Pete Carroll has a little bit more control and it worked out for a while. Right. Um, but you know, sometimes it doesn't right. Like the John Gruden, Mike Mayock stuff. Um, but you know, I, you, you can just hire them independently and just say, Hey, you, you two have to work together. Like the, there's a lot of general managers and coaches where that's been the case. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that that's a huge risk. Uh, also from Ryan, is there any way the Vikings can build a roster with cousins as $45 million cap at next year, or will the next GM be forced to extend them? Uh, poof. it depends on if you can trade him. I'll talk about that in uh the next question but primarily um i i think that you can build a roster around cousins 45 million dollar cap hit um it, you just have to i guess be good that's there's not really another way around it you have to be really smart about your ability to identify talent and free agency you're gonna have to cut some guys um you might have to extend different people, right? Which might be worse overall, because if you have five contracts that you extend that you can't get out of, that you need to get out of, that's worse than one, right? But you can restructure some contracts so that they hit in the second and third year of their contracts as opposed to in 2022. So you can structure your contract so that, um, you know, they get a bunch of bonus money now and the big hits come in 2023 and 2024 um, and and build around the fact that there's a $45 million, essentially a hole in your roster. But it would be tough because there's a lot of dead money for the Vikings in 2022, including the Anthony Barr contract. Um, the Vikings will be taking on, I believe, a $9 million dead cap hit um, to not have Anthony Barr on the team. Um, but it's just the way that the void um, years work for the way that they restructure that contract. But, um, I, I do think it's possible. It's just really tough. You have to, you know, do some tightrope stuff. And I think it is really unlikely. Yeah. I think unlikely is the best way to put that. Uh, Kyle Williams says, uh, in a hypothetical world, is there any situation where the Vikings would trade cousins for anything less than a first round pick? Yeah. And then Kyle Williams, uh, Clarifies, you know, picks only. You can't throw in players, right? So, um, uh, yes, uh, I think that the only way that that happens. So I reached out to Jason Fitzgerald at Over the Cap about this. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, and uh, I, I was like, I can't figure out Cousins' trade value because, you know, there's only one year left on his contract. You know, he's not elite, right? He's just very good. Um, and uh, it's a pretty hefty contract because he's going to take the fourth or fifth most cap space of any quarterback in the NFL next year. So the next team is going to have to extend him. And so that's going to be part of the cost that they'll incorporate. And so they'll offer less. And so he said, well, you know, the comparison here is probably Alex Smith who had a one year left on his contract, but cost significantly less and went for a third round pick and a player like fuller, I think. Um, and, uh, and so that's like a three and a four or a three and a five, depending on how you how you uh, value Fuller. And uh, and so you might be able to get Cousins just for uh, a third round pick and then some. And I you know I I don't think because he's a better quarterback than Alex Smith, but he's not. Um, but his his cap hit is bigger, and I, I think that he's probably worth a little bit more than that on the open market. So I would I would I guess I'd kind of disagree with Fitzgerald there. But the primary question I had was, well, okay, so if we take a look at something like Sam Bradford who, by the way, only exceeded, uh, only met or exceeded 11% of the salary cap um, in two of his years in the NFL, um, which was both times for the Rams. Um, when the Rams traded him to the Eagles, the Rams took on part of his contract. When the Eagles traded him to the Vikings, not only did he have two years, instead of one year left on his contract, he had two years, but the Eagles also took on some of the cap hits. The Vikings only had $7 million of cap space to take on in 2016 when they traded for him. Um because I was thinking about that when I was talking to him and I was like, well, this is interesting because he never actually cost a team that much. So what, what's going on there? Um, I thought that Sam Bradford, who, you know, there was a deadline motivated reason to escalate that to a first round pick. Like it was right before the season. Um, but, you know, Sam Bradford's not a terrible comparison because at the time in my head, he cost a lot of money, um, you know, because the whole meme about Sam Bradford is that he was just incredible at taking money. Um, 
which is true. It just the cap hits never materialized because it always showed up as dead cap for the previous team. Um, yeah, it was. It was. He was. Uh, he wasn't as good as Matt Flynn, but he was good. Yeah, yeah, not quite Matt Flynn. Um, non quarterback Hall of Famer Darrell Rivas, uh, not quite there, but pretty good. Um, I, I was. I meant Hall of Famer in terms of like salary negotiations, but yeah, I guess Darrell Rivas gets to get into the Hall of Fame for real too. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, if the Vikings take on, like, say, if they if they offer Cousins a a replacement contract that is a one year forty five million dollar contract with a ten million dollar signing bonus, they would take on ten million dollars. The other team gets a cost control quarterback thirty five million dollars, um, playing at a level more commensurate to thirty five million dollars than forty five million dollars for sure. And in my head, that would escalate it to uh, maybe a first round pick, but more likely a second round pick. Um, now it is entirely possible that the Vikings could do a sign and trade, which I believe never happens in the NFL. Maybe it happened once. It doesn't really happen in the NFL, but that's possible, right? They sign them to a contract and uh, before March 16th or whatever the the first day or the third day of the league year is, um, and uh, and and create a contract structure that is palatable to another team, and then trade the entire contract this time with a without a no trade clause um, or with the no trade clause waived for certain teams. Um, and maybe get a first round pick for that. But I can't imagine any team agreeing to that because why would you give up a first round pick for a contract that you were going to offer anyway? So um, my guess is you, you, the Vikings take on some of that and then they would have to only take on a second round pick because there's only one year left on that contract. So would the Vikings do that? I don't think so, but it is possible. And, you know, the more picks for the Vikings, the better. I think the most ideal scenario here is that the Vikings do that, get a second round pick, and then trade the second round pick for a future first, which they then use to move up for a quarterback in the 2023 draft. Yeah, that's right. Any way we could convince uh, Philly that what they really need is Kirk Cousins? They have an abundance of first round picks. Yeah, I don't think that that's happening. Yeah, but he's just not going to fit in with the horse punchers, I guess. <laughs> no, he just doesn't have as much um, horse punching personality. No, definitely not. Let's go to Damian Barrett, who asks, should the winner of the Hell League automatically get an interview for the upcoming uh, Vikings head coaching job? Also, has there ever been a back-to-back Hall of Fame season? Uh, side note, can we buy a Patreon subscription for Don's wife for Valentine's Day? Oh, my God. Uh no reason to do that to Don, to expose Don's wife to all of the questions Don asks about the relationship um, first. <laughs> that's 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 basically like a relationship cheat code, and I don't support it. <laughs> Second, yes, Damien, the winner of the Hell League should automatically get an interview for the upcoming Vikings head coach job. Also, it should be recorded, and also it should be uh, played for patrons. That seems like it would be amazing to hear that interview. The fact that I lost in the semis this uh, this week just grinds my gears so much. I wanted I wanted to be able to hang my hat and say that I was the winner of the uh, of the Norse Code Hell League this year, but sadly that is not the case. The finals are this week. Why is it this week the the worst week of football? Because it's the Hell League. That is my justification for forgetting to change that setting in the uh, in the playoffs <laughs> on Yahoo. So the Hell League finals are this week between Damian and uh, uh, DJ, my buddy from uh, from Detroit, so or from from Michigan rather. So that is uh, that is interesting. I believe the seventh seed and the second seed are uh, are battling for uh, for the championship. So this. Uh, this is just so stupid. This whole league is wonderful. I'm opening it up next year. I've changed my tune. I think the world needs the Hell League, and the Hell League needs you. So we're gonna we're gonna open this up a bit in the fall. Uh, definitely at least one additional league plus one additional one for the Patreon people. So we'll uh, we'll see. Your Patreon dollars could result in needing therapy, which I mean, fair. You're you're already getting bonus episodes, so you're you're basically getting that anyway. So, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll do something like that. Let's go to uh, to Stephen who asks a, a family question. Really, 
Says, so, uh, this weekend, my family drove up from Kansas City for a couple of days to subjugate my children to a Minnesota winter before we move up here later this year. As true out-of-towners and needing indoor activities, we opted to go on a stadium tour. Much to my surprise, my daughter asked for a series of Vikings merchandise afterwards, proudly declaring that she is a Vikings fan. Finally, I felt like I was winning against my in-laws, attempting to turn the children into Kansas City fans. Then the game happened later that night. On a scale of 1 to 28, and I love the fact that he chose Adrian Peterson's number here, <laughs> how, how bad of a father am I for forcing this life upon them instead of letting them choose? Uh, well, uh, I, I cannot say 28 because that would be reserved for people who use switches, uh, <laughs> um, you know, famously. Famously. Right. But pretty high on the scale right like because because it's not just that you've consigned this person to uh apparently a life of vikings fandom it's that there was a viable alternative in kansas city like it was right there and 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 you're competing to get your daughter away from kansas city towards the vikings that's wild that's like gotta be at least a 20, if not a 24 on the scale. That's crazy to me. And you could argue that, you know, it's AFC. It, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's like cheating when you're in Europe. It's, it's there, there's enough mileage <laughs> distance there where it, yeah, that, that sort of thing works. Yeah. This is why the relationship corner has been, uh, one of the most well heralded advice corners of the internet. I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying that's where the philosophy of this <laughs> yeah, thing yeah, yeah. I, 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 would, I would say that that falls to the wayside when it's family and you're and you inherently compete, especially like an in-law, right? You inherently compete for uh, the the kids' fandom, right? Like it's then I think the AFC NFC stuff kind of washes away. And you're just trying to get the kid to like one team. Um, yeah, that I get it. Well, let's go to uh, let's go to Don from Ohio. Who asks, uh, who are some GM candidates for the Vikings to, uh, to choose from? Um, so there's a couple. I'm going to link a, a piece that goes into a number of them. Um, my inclination, of course, is to try and find, um, you know, a, a, a general manager that comes from a team that is analytically inclined. So, um, for example, the Browns apparently have, um, have a, quote, a hot name uh, who was interviewed a couple of times in the last cycle. Um, named Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, who is the Browns Vice President of Football Operations. Um, I think the Browns are, are a well-run team, which is a very weird sentence to say. Um, I think that the issue with the Browns this year, of course, is Baker Mayfield's injury. Um, and, you know, maybe he's just not a good quarterback anymore, but I think that his injury is primarily the issue. Um, and obviously the, the team itself with Stefanski is a run first team, but it kind of, it's been working for them and they've been getting good players. And it, it, it seems like they... You know, they invest in the offensive line a lot. It seems like they have a way to to identify free agent talent. So um, the Browns make sense, and, and Quasio Dofo Mensa seems to be a good part of that process. So that's something to kind of consider. Does not have a football background, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. But you surround yourself with enough football people, I think that you can kind of resolve that. The Eagles are also a very analytically inclined organization. Um, one play or one person from the Eagles that's listed in this article, Brandon Brown, the Eagles director of player personnel, um, he played football in college, uh, apparently has a law degree, a college coaching background. He scouted for the Colts and he oversees their pro scouting department for Philadelphia. Um, I guess Glenn Cook is also a member of the Browns, a vice president of player personnel, former linebacker, um, and has been part of the uh, player acquisition side for the Browns. So that's something to keep in mind. There's a couple of players, uh, people from the Bills that are listed here. Um, Malik Boyd, the senior director of pro scouting. Um, the bills obviously have been pretty successful. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, from the Colts, you know, we mentioned that they might actually be a team that could be better than the rest of the league in the draft, just in case that's true. Try to hire some of those guys, uh, some of those guys, uh, Ed Dodds is their assistant general manager. So again, something to kind of keep in mind. Um, yeah, uh, there's a bunch of names on here. There's a couple of players. Uh, I keep saying players. A couple of people from the Saints. I don't want Jeff Ireland. I don't like him, but that's, you know, there's a couple of people from the Saints on here. A um, couple of people from the Chiefs. I, I don't know if the Chiefs are really the best place to kind of draw upon, but 
they're probably not the worst for sure. Um, a couple more people from the Bills. Uh, Elliot Wolf is a Patriots consultant. I know that there's kind of this thing about getting people from the Patriots, but I thought Scott Pioli and, and uh, Dimitrov actually did a really good job on the player personnel side of things. And so I don't think that the thing about Patriots assistant coaches really actually applies to the front office people. They seem to actually be doing a good job. Elliot Wolf was with the Packers. And then I believe, and this is kind of a rumor, so again, not really for attribution, it's not really reporting, but I believe he left because he thought he was going to get the general manager job at the Packers. Then they picked Gutekunst, and um, he didn't really like that. So he's Ron Wolf's son. Um, Ron Wolf was a, a kind of a legend uh, with the Packers front office. So also something to keep in mind. Um, also, directly from the Patriots, the director of player personnel, Dave Ziegler, is on this list. He w- he took on the role of de facto GM, according to Jonathan Jones, who wrote this article, um, who's with the team after Nick Casario left for Houston in that weird witchcraft scenario. So um, those are all people that are on this list. But I want to say, I have no idea what makes for a good general manager. Um, I think that our ability to predict who's going to be a good general manager or a bad general manager is awful. We just don't do a very good job of predicting it. And it's because it relies on a lot of stuff that we just don't have access to in terms of information. And the information that we do get is highly filtered. And so they'll do, we'll see these like profiles on general managers and general manager candidates that are essentially curated by those, by those people. Uh, And so they'll emphasize all these things that, you know, people say are important for general managers to do. And maybe they are, um, without really going over kind of what the pitfalls might be, um, it's it's tough to figure out. It's even tougher than finding out who who a good coach is. And I've said a couple of times in the show now, yeah, I've got no idea who's going to be a good head coach. Also from Don from Ohio, what's more egregious, Kyle Sloter being cut or the fact that I'm not in Hawaii yet? Uh, both are blessings. <laughs> Truly. Uh, finally, if the Colts lose on Sunday and you are the Raiders or Chargers, do you contact the other team and make an agreement to play for a tie? Will there be consequences for their actions if they do play for a tie? Um, I think that there would be consequences for their actions if they play for a tie, unless you make it look like a football game. But like, uh, because if you just kneel out every drive, right, um, then it's pretty obvious what you're doing. If you finish the game 28-28, boy, that's going to be tougher to prove unless, again, some obvious stuff happens during the game. Uh, No, there would definitely be consequences. Uh, First, I think it might be against the actual law. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but I I feel like it would be. That doesn't always hold up one-to-one. I'm not really a great predictor of what is or isn't illegal, Uh, but uh, I feel like that's against the actual law. I, I can just view that being quoted on the Twitter account for uh, for North Code out of context. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, fair. But, um, <laughs> the, the reason why big conspiracy theories are fun but impossible is because of the uh, simply because of the, the, the large number of people who would have to end up being involved. Right. So you you would have to tell Derek Carr who has incentives in his contract for throwing touchdowns, right? To just not do it, right? You'd have- And who has said nothing but nice things about both uh, his former coach and being like, I'll pray, I'll pray for him and everything, right. to, to the receiver who killed a guy earlier this year. Like, yeah, yeah. If anyone's going to be honest to a T, it's, yeah, it's going to be him, right? Like, you got Derek Carr there. Yeah, this guy is- extremely strict ethically speaking it very much seems i'm not like. so i'm not saying marcus Mariota is gonna like it would be would, would be a better option here i'm just saying he's not Derek carr <laughs> right. Derek carr and kirk cousins appear to be cut from the same cloth yeah that's true um so i, I it would be pretty hard to convince some of these players and some of these rosters to do something like that. But uh, from the consequences perspective, I think that there's legal consequences. I think that there almost certainly are NFL consequences. You would um, see people suspended from the league. You cannot mess with money, especially now that sports gambling is legal. You can't mess with money. Um, And so you would see uh, people lose their jobs, banned from the sport. Um, It would look like gambling, even though it's not. Uh, so you probably don't get kind of the, the, the Ted Karras treatment. 
was it Ted or Alex? One of them is the son. One of them was banned for a while. Um, should, should have also banned Paul Horning if we're kind of, you know, keeping it 100% honest, but um, you're not going to get the gambling treatment, but it's match fixing. Like the, you're, the NFL is not going to be okay with that, but also no way do these teams agree to it. There are incentives and contracts. There's, um, you know, if you win, you're in anyway. So obviously a tie would secure their capability of, uh, of making it in the case where the, the Colts lose to, by the way, this scenario requires Jacksonville to beat the Colts, right? Like that's the scenario. Which they've done in Jacksonville before. Yeah. I don't – it's not something that I would consider likely. Yeah, the Vikings beat put, the Packers this year too, James. I Listen, <laughs> all things are all things are possible through the power of Ben DiNucci. We've oh, covered this on right. the show. Yeah, it, and in particular on a team with Ben DiNucci. Okay, so yeah. Yes. But it is uh, – it is – it is on the table, but I, I would say, hmm. <laughs> I would say unlikely, but yeah, I, I don't think that you can get um, all 106 people to agree to it and keep it quiet. And those are just players, um, coaches, coaching staffs, etc. I just, there's no way. And then um, because the NFL is more about your reputation, uh, it would be tough. Now your reputation is not permanent. Greg Williams was unsuspended and found a job basically immediately. Uh, Josh McDaniels has been floated around as a potential head coach, despite stiffing the Colts. But you know, I, I don't, I don't see it happening. And then there's enough people of, uh, of strong enough moral fiber that this probably wouldn't happen. I, j- but also like if you're, if, if you've got a, a half a million dollar sack incentive that you need to hit, no way are you accepting the other team kneeling for no reason. Like absolutely you're blowing by Alex Leatherwood, whoever, and trying to plaster Derek Carr. Yeah. Yep. There's uh there's no way that works. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of North code. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. We'll be back later this week to preview the final game of the regular season. Uh, well, I say the regular season as if there's, you know, more to it. The Vikings already won their Super Bowl, So there's, right. you know, what, what more is there to prove? Uh, Arif, what do you have to plug? Uh, yeah, I've got a piece coming out uh, tomorrow about whether or not the Vikings waved the white flag and what that might mean and whether or not they should have played Mannion or Mond, um, which I detailed in a lot uh, <laughs> earlier in the episode. But there's more. There's numbers and stuff, so you can find that at The Athletic. Uh, and then um, that Kirk Cousins piece I was teasing, we've pushed that, so that's going to be uh, later, kind of after the season in a retrospective. Um, and then there's also another piece coming later this week that I already know what it's about, but I don't want to spoil it. Um, over at The Athletic. You can find all of that at theathletic.com slash author slash Arif dash Hassan or follow me on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. All right, that's going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back later this week. So for Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember that the Vikings are not to be trusted. And we'll be back later this week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan of The Athletic, and he can be found at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN, or my personal account, at BigMono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can do so in a few different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash norsecode and donate there. For $3.50 a month, you get bonus material and more. You can also go to paypal.me slash norsecode for a one-time donation, or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up some Norse Code merchandise. Any questions or comments that cannot fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, Thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. Hey, all things are possible through the power of Ben DiNucci.